as we know, the pandemic is a time of great uncertainty and ambiguity. It's one requiring leadership and frequent communication. A lot hinges on leaders' abilities to function as active, authentic, and trusted communicators. But how leaders at all levels do this quickly and effectively in a time when so much is unknown can be a challenge. So today, our hope is to explore tools to help us delve into conversations with transparency and authenticity to meet the many obstacles this pandemic poses head on. To help us do this, we have three experts. Uh, Barbara Ballack, she's co-founder of Athena Partners. She's one of the co-authors on our white paper, A Framework for Joy and Work. She's a longtime senior faculty member here at IHI and formerly at um, the National Patient Safety Foundation. We also have Kate Hilton. She's leadership faculty at the Atlantic Fellows for Health Equity Program at GW. She's a longtime faculty at IHI. She's currently supporting our Joy in Work Results-Oriented Learning Network, uh, among many other things. <laughs> and finally, we have Dr. Don Berwick. He's a regular anchor, anchor on the series, former administrator for CMS and President Emeritus of IHI. Thank you, panelists, for being here today. Um, Don, we'll start with you, if that's okay. Um, you've written a lot about leadership over the years and have held many leadership roles. Um, there seems to be a gap between the intention of leaders to support and listen to staff and the impact where staff feel, in, in many cases, unheard or underappreciated and, in the worst cases, unsafe. Uh, can you speak a little bit from your experience on this? Why is this particularly important uh, during the pandemic? Happy to do that, Jessica. Thank you. Shout out also to our wonderful IHI team, Julia and Jess and Vicky and Matt and the whole team. Uh, these guys are doing a great job um, in a, on tough logistic circumstances. It's a pleasure to be with you all. Uh, and Barbara and Kate, two uh, friends and admired colleagues of mine, uh, I can't think of more wisdom to assemble in one room than just have the two of them talk about this. So I can't wait to hear what they have to say. Um, I think your question Jess is a pretty is a really deep one. Um, I'll tell you a quick story. When I took over the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, 5,500 employees who didn't know me, um, a friend of mine said, "I've got one piece of advice for you, Don. Here's what, how to think about it. Um, have, you ever, have you ever been in a really crowded restaurant and you've seen a waiter with a tr big full tray navigating through the crowd?" He holds that tray way up high so that nobody touches it, so that you just, so that it's really safe. He said, you're on that tray. What he meant was that there's a dynamic in the leadership relationship that distances the leader sociologically from everyone else, especially the chief executive. Uh, and there are all sorts of reasons for that. One is fear, one is kindness. People are protecting the leader. They want, they want that person to be happy for all sorts of reasons. They don't want to muddy the waters or stir the pot. Uh, and so uh, one of the answers to the, your question is that I think leaders are inadvertently protected from information. They, there's, a, there's a dynamic that keeps them from knowing what's really, really happening. And I've learned that the hard way in a lot of the leadership jobs I've had, which means the uh, energy and the what you call the authenticity to inquire is absolutely essential. There's got to be a set of activities in which a leader who cares is there. You've got to go there and be with people and reach to them and listen. And you also have to know is they're not going to give you bad news. Not most of them. They're, they're, they're going to be keeping you from knowing the very thing you wish to find out. Things like what's the level of fear around here? Uh, what's going wrong because I'm doing something wrong? Uh, what do you need from me that you don't think I will give? Uh, all these questions have to be offered with real sincerity, real authenticity, and you just have to listen. And that's a skill base that is very, very hard to develop. Uh, of course, there's the other side of the coin, which is wrong leadership theory. Leaders who approach the job with a sense of control and that they're, you know, they've got to be smarter than everybody and they've got all the answers and these these darn staff won't do what they should, and they've got to make them do it. Any control-oriented, incentive-based, contingent, transactional approach to leadership will scare people and deny you, the leader, the information you really need. And unfortunately, despite so many years of effort, that's still 
unfortunately, probably the more common way to lead. IHI's very nature, uh, I hope and believe, is to encourage communities of effort which overcome that impoverished theory that it's all about incentive, it's all about contingency, it's all about transaction and move into relationship building and listening and teamwork, equity and, and, and uh, equality, a kind of evenness. So Barbara, I don't know two teachers stronger than, 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 mm. than Barbara and Kate to help us understand what that kind of leadership is like. And I look forward to hearing their thoughts. And I'll say I could be wrong. I, I think there are a lot of other good theories about why things go wrong. But uh, that's some of what some of what I'm thinking. Thank you for that, Don. Can I just riff for a second on the first part of what you were speaking to, which is the need to kind of get out there and get get yourself visible. Um, you've written about Gemba, you've written about some tri tips and tricks to do that. Do you have any recommendations for folks, especially virtually now, when they can't actually get on the floor and, and get in front of staff? Are there any tools you found helpful at CMS or otherwise? It's so much harder, I think, electronically, because uh, a lot of it is uh, kind of what I call appropriate touch, I guess, being in, like, I, I just got an email from an employee who I who I don't know very well. He, uh, he was only there at ICHI a short time, but I, I just emailed him to see how he was doing because I, I knew there were some stresses. And he, what he wrote back was he remembered the time I went in his office, sat down and talked with him and asked him some questions about his family. It, you just got to put that time in and getting, people, getting to know people. I think the other thing I might say, I wonder what Kate and Barbara will say, is um, di disclosure, uh, kind of opening one's own vulnerability um, quick story there. I, I, when I took over CMS, I called an all hands meeting, an all staff meeting, all 5,500 people on the third day there against the advice of, of most of my staff. But I, um, I wanted people to see me and, uh, quite, quite offhand, uh, without kind of intending it. I, I, my very first slide was a photo of my family, my wife, my children, and my grandchildren. And I just decided to introduce them all. Um, I probably heard about that slide more than anything else I ever did with the staff at CMS, the idea that I would come and talk to my family. And that was intuitive. I'm not, you know, I, 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 I stumbled into it, but that taught me something about what really builds relationship. It is tougher in the COVID period and we're gonna have to mm. learn new skills. Thank you for that. And thank you folks who are chatting in some examples of how you're doing this with virtual town halls and other, keep them, keep the comments coming in the chat. Um, thank you, Don. And actually, Barbara, as a former CEO yourself, can you speak a little bit to this challenge that folks are experiencing with senior leaders in communication? You know, what do you think is most important right now in this time that we're going through to effective communication? You know, and, and I'm going to throw a bunch of questions at you at once. <laughs> what have you seen leaders doing well? Where do you see room for growth? And what specifically can they can they do to provide kind of proactive support to manage fear and anxiety that, that Don was talking about? Yeah, yeah, great questions and great lead in by Don as always. Um, and, and I echo the things that Don said, my greatest fear as a hospital and clinic CEO, I'd, I, I think have had most leadership roles in a health system that you could have. And my greatest fear in those senior executive roles is what I didn't know. And there's also that myth besides being on top of that tray, that somehow when you get into those positions, you're smarter than everybody else. And that is really terrifying. And so if you combine that, that lack of information, and, and, and this applies uh, if you're a manager of a clinic, if you are in a community-based setting, um, people will start protecting you or withholding information. Some of it is about you and some of, it of, of them not wanting to look incompetent. So there's lots of dynamics at play. So I try and sort through, well, what's the noise that will make it better? My greatest gift were the truth tellers, those who would come and say, well, Barbara, you meant to sound like this, um, but you've heard me say this about one colleague. She would say, well, Barbara, you were a bit crisp in that meeting. Um, you need those truth tellers around you. And so, and sometimes welcoming those, it's good in the head. And then when it actually happens, you go, well, that's not so fun. So I think it's Don's statement of vulnerability. Um, so congratulations to those of you, the many of you who are on this call today, um, who are stepping forward, learning 
continuing together to figure out how we do this better. The good news is, is if we can do it in during a pandemic, during financial crises, it's going to serve us well forever. So, you know, congratulations for being here. I have this wonderful quote from Don um, to remind me that, Don, many years ago, I was a new uh, executive and you were just beginning to form IHI. And you came to the health system. I was part of a children's health system in Minneapolis, St. Paul area. And we were one of the grantees about learning about quality from um, industry. And so Don, and I was working with some folks who weren't very skilled at the time. And uh, I thought, well, maybe it was me. Um, and I think it was a combination of things. And Don and colleagues showed us a way forward. And that way forward has stood the test of time. So we're gonna build on that today. Um, so uh, I also wanna recognize this is about the whole team. So while I might be talking about leaders and senior leaders, it's what we do on behalf of the entire team. So many of our colleagues are dealing with so many different stresses. Um, I come from the Midwest. I grew up in a farm in Iowa and all my IHI colleagues have seen as Don does lots of family pictures. And um, after 11 days, three families just finally got power back after a huge, they call it a direct or an inland hurricane there. So you're dealing with, as my sister-in-law as a pediatrician said, who knew there was something else to pay attention to besides COVID? So lots of issues going on with lots of folks. So let's go to the next slide and just talk real briefly about what we and others have learned. And Amy Edmondson is my most recent, well, last five, 10 years, favorite author. And when Don talks about leadership theory, I think Amy can help us. There's lots of good authors out there, um, but she's really truly an expert on psychological safety and she knows healthcare well, she's at Harvard. So what do we know about what effective leaders do? Well, they illuminate a sense of purpose and meaning. Um, I refer to it as our personal why. Why do we show up? Why do we do this work? So Don talking about his family, any of us who talk about what it means to us to do this work, um, and I have a niece who works at Stanford Hospital. And um, as a young nurse, it's been very vital for her to be reminded why you do this work when she goes in and works 12 hours at a time, many with patients with COVID. The second is being present. Um, as Don talked about, showing up in people's spaces. It's harder now with virtual, um, but what is worse is nothing. And that's where people make stuff up. Absence of anything, absence of presence by you, either virtually or in person, people will make stuff up about what's really happening. Um, third, engage in conversations. Kate's gonna talk about, and she's just a marvelous expert, on open and honest questions. Don talked about listening. And when we ask people, we have to be willing to stand in a space and say, hmm, that's really interesting. Tell me more about that. And what we often do as leaders, we want to get in there and fix it for people. We want to alleviate some of the pain that we see in our colleagues. Sometimes we do it by defending, sometimes by explaining, and sometimes by saying, well, I'll fix that. Now, sometimes it's really appropriate to fix something right away but often we fix it wrong. And that's where quality improvement and all the skills we know about come in. And um, a, a good colleague, Jonathan Warren, who's a senior executive at one of the NHS trusts in England, gave me an example a few weeks ago that he learned early on that when you're asking people about what issues they're dealing with, um, he would often hear PPE, it's PPE, and he knew the numbers, the data of what they had. They had available PPE. And so he learned to ask more about what that was about. What's really about that PPE? What's underneath that? And finally, to build psychological safety, and that's based on humility, curiosity, empathy, inclusion. Um, and those, as Don said, are skills. They're tough skills, but we can learn them. They not, they're not impossible. You don't have to be born with them. The, the most courageous thing I think I ever said as a leader, I said it to a large group is, I don't know what I'm doing. And I think somebody's gonna find out. That's my greatest fear. It was that imposter syndrome. So next slide, Jess, I'll just talk about that briefly. 
is solution finding together. I've long talked about are we doing to, for, or with our colleagues and our patients and families. And so here's some examples that come from the IHI white paper. I won't read them, but some examples of what asking good questions look like and how you listen. And the downside when leaders aren't doing well is the inverse, just the opposite. So it's not a whole other set of lists. It's just paying attention to these two slides as far as what the content is, and then the content that Kate will talk about. So I'll let um, Kate build on this, and then maybe we can come back and make sure we address as many people's questions and their thoughts and suggestions as possible. Oh, I should talk about this. One more minute, Kate, sorry. Um, one of the things that, as I said, when you have truth tellers or people who want to coach you, um, uh, here's some steps. My least favorite experience as a CEO is someone would come to me and say, I need your support. It would be very vague. And then you would have this sound in your ear of a dump truck backing up and dumping this whole long list of things and then kind of sitting there hoping you would fix it. And that's not helpful. It's not helpful for you and it's not helpful for them as, as leaders. So here's some helpful hits. First, be clear um, on why you're showing up and what choices you have. You can show up in a solution mind frame or you can show up saying, here's my dump truck. Can you fix it? Can you drive the dump truck for me? Ask for what you need. Don't hint, hint and hope um, and share the issue especially through a story. You know, telling a story is the key area here. Scope the issue. Don't talk about everything. Talk about what's most pressing right now. You can always build from there. Keep the system you're trying to improve in mind, but start with a single process if you can. And in uh, interest, saying your interest is in working with them to find a solution and you need help. Um, do they have other ideas about solution finding? How can we do this together? Here's some things we've already tested, learned from, gained from, and then an invitation to go to where the work is, where the dilemma is. Um, I've worked with executives who are terrified of being in a clinical setting or being in a setting they're not familiar with. Um, so you can be that bridge to help them be successful. So I'll pause there. That is wonderful. Thank you so much, Barbara. I was laughing when you said the sound of the dump truck backing up because I imagine there's there's many dump trucks, a lot of them backing up towards leaders right now with lots of problems and that can be completely overwhelming. So these yeah. um these tips are really helpful. I also think Kate, before you dive into some of the how of those conversations, can you tell us a little bit about this um conversation and action guide? This is the thing we're gonna be kind of pulling apart big time on this call and trying to hopefully, um, Vicki's going to share a link to it in the chat, hopefully help folks um, really understand how to use it. And, and, and if you could, Kate, can you speak to us about its nascency? How did it come about? Why are these conversations so important? Um, yeah. <laughs> You got it, Jess. So um, first of all, it came about because of the practical genius that is Barbara um, and her ability to identify a need and develop very actionable steps to address it. I, I You've already actually heard part of why it was developed. Barbara mentioned that she has a niece who works as a nurse at Stanford. And Barbara is the kind of leader that fills gaps. If she sees a need, she thinks, what, what, what am I uniquely positioned to contribute Kate, in this moment? Um, and sorry to interrupt you, So Kate. in uh, response to an April 2020 article by uh, Tate Shanafel and others entitled Understanding in a dress. Sorry, Kate, can, can you hear me right now? Among health. Barbara, why don't I turn it to you to answer this? Well, I, I can hear you just fine. Okay, you're pretty, call in. You, yeah, if you don't mind. And, and the other thing I was going to suggest is turning your video off. Sometimes that helps with bandwidth. Thank you. Thanks is for this. That. Is that improving the sound or should I just call in? Ah, so let's try that for now and I'll let you know in the chat if it, if it's still breaking up. Would you like me to start again or just carry on? I think we could hear you. Um, you asked Barbara to chime in on, on what exactly? I was going to let her take over if you prefer that I call in. 
Oh, no, you know what? We can hear you now. So keep going. Okay. <laughs> All right, I'll keep in there. Okay, so um, there was a great piece uh, in April 2020 about understanding and addressing sources of anxiety among healthcare professionals during the COVID pandemic. And um, Barbara saw that as an actionable place to begin to think about how do we actually have these conversations? What does it look like when we say the words? What's the practice in communicating with each other? And so um, we worked together to connect that to the Joy and Work framework um, so that it was also clearly articulated within the research that you, Jess, and others have done around um, what does create joy in work and how can we connect the ways in which we're communicating to the actual drivers of joy. Um, so that not only are we having these conversations now to address people's well being and joy in work, but we're then able to pivot to create sustained change in this moment where we have an opportunity for amazing redesign, where we have to address staff well-being and joy and work and seizing that as an opportunity, not only for changing how we're communicating, how we're, how we're actually taking action to address staff well-being, but then also to remember in this framework how to continue and sustain those gains as um, the, the crisis moves to recovery. So you'll see on the next slide, um, the joy and work framework from the white paper. And um, as, as Barbara and Don both alluded to, the first question is to ask staff what matters to you. Um, and then from there to in those conversations of co-creation and understanding um, people's true values and intrinsic motivations. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that if, if I could in, in a moment, but uh, to, to listen for the unique impediments uh, to join work, what um, Steve Swenson calls pebbles in our shoes. And, um, and then from there, to, to commit to make a mutual commitment together through our, our co-production of what joy should look like um, at all, all levels, not just at the front line, but middle manager, senior leaders and um, then together using improvement science to create a learning system to set a name to create measures around whether we know we've been into then test chain say cycles around achieve uh true joy and wellness well and and then reduce we see above but this is a it's a in some ways it looks very straightforward uh <laughs> it, but as we all know how change works it is uh it is something that that takes um enormous effort and uh, a lot of work with one another on the adaptive human side of change. I'm going to turn it to Barbara. Yeah, Kate, um, thank you. So for... that I can call in just. Yeah, yeah, go right ahead. Um, and so Kate just showed us the how of the Joy and Work Framework, which you can read more about in the white paper link that Vicki already chatted in at the top of the hour. Um, and the, this first step, this this asking what matters is really what the conversation guide is all about. And um, Kate was asking Barbara, if you could speak a little bit to the what of the work, of course, there's so much on this slide, we won't have time to delve into all of it. But um, can you speak to us at a high level of kind of the what of the joy and work framework? The components of the joy and work approach are very similar to some of the other pieces from IHI. Uh, about what each of us own. And as you can see, uh, senior leaders and managers and core leaders, those part of the organization, whatever organization you're part of, really own a great deal of this. And so we tried to identify what are the key bodies of work. And so you can see physical and psychological safety. And aren't we seeing a huge amount of that need right now? Um, am I safe physically at work? Am I safe psychologically at work? Can I speak up? if something's not going well? Am I clear about meaning and purpose? And do I have some choice and autonomy? Um, we're finding that um, those three plus camaraderie and teamwork, those four are the most powerful elements in a healthy work environment. So as we talk about asking questions, listening, um, offering support, problem solving together, um, keep those things in mind as far as, am I demonstrating meaning and purpose? Um, thanking people for what they do and the contributions and being specific about it. So maybe the next slide we can, uh, until Kate gets back. Um, she's here now. Oh, go ahead. Let's, let's test that out, Kate. Uh, but if you called in on your phone, you're automatically muted. Um, Try again. 
Is this better? Can you hear me? Yes, yes. we can. We'll give that a go. Yay. <laughs> Sorry about this. <laughs> um, so, yes. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, this is, um, in fact, I apologize, there's not a source on this slide, but this is William Bridges' work on transitions, and it is about how we all experience change. So that could be, um, in fact, I invite everyone on the call to sort of check in with yourself for a second and to consider um, back in March as COVID-19 was ramping up um, where you felt yourself in these four stages of change. The first is denial. Um, that's the experience of shock that this could happen to me, that, for example, COVID could come here to where I am. Um, and uh, the second, then, is a stage of resistance. So this is a psychological experience, mostly of fear, kind of underneath all of this is fear. But it shows up as bargaining or frustration, anger, uncertainty. Um, and, and often, as change leaders, as improvers, we are frequently working with other staff uh, around how to help them move from a place of resistance for whatever improvement we're trying to make in our system um, to one of exploration where we invite folks to join us to take a first step with us to experiment with what that change could look like and feel like and begin to see a hopefulness and an acceptance of what's possible and seeing the opportunities um, and that takes work. It takes work internally ourselves. Um, it also takes work to invite others into a space where, where they can pivot and make that shift with us. It doesn't mean, by the way, that this is all linear. Uh, it's not, it's not, you can live in uh, resistance and exploration at the same time. You can have multiple changes happening to you at the same time uh, around which you feel different things. Um, but ideally, as we move along, we get to a place of understanding and integration and you know, I can speak for myself and Barbara and Donna, I'd be curious about how you, how you felt in March, but I definitely was in a place of bargaining, fear, anxiety. <laughs> I, had, I had gotten out of that denial pretty quick, but um, how about you guys? How are you feeling? Well, I had just chatted in uh, fear of loss and uncertainty, especially having a, a dear friend and colleague who was one of the first um, COVID cases in Colorado and nearly died. Um, and so I, I went from, you know, warp speed from denial to, oh, my gosh, this is real. This is happening. Um, so and I circle through that up pretty regularly still today. Thanks, Barbara. And how about for me? Uh, I, yeah, you know, uh, it's a wonderful slide. I, the uncertainty would be where I put myself right now, and then this constant battle every day: should I go into that store? Is this a place I should wear a mask? Can I can I hug my grandchild? Uh, will our grandchildren go back to school? The the number of things I don't know is just so big and highly consequential, and I find that uh, I find it difficult to navigate through all of that. Yeah, so this is the experience of change, and we're, we're in a, a moment of unbelievable change all the time, and it is taking so much energy from our limbic system just to manage all that fear and anxiety. And where we want to be is up here in our, like, prefrontal cortex, right? And the same thing when we're working with staff around what they're experiencing, not only with regard to COVID, but with regard to any system problem that we're working on an improvement, that we're inviting them into a process of change around. And so we have to acknowledge and empathize with that feeling. We know what it's like to feel angry or to feel scared or to feel um, uncertain about what, what, what it's going to look like. And yet we also um, we have hope as leaders, as change agents, of what's possible. And we can see this opportunity of if we come together um, and we explore what's workable for people, um, what we could commit to in making change around, in our case, staff well-being. Um, so let's just, I'll sort of zip through the next slide so we can get into um, Q&A with everyone. But this is really about making an individual pivot in ourselves around not just saying, like, here's my change idea. Here's how I want everybody's well-being to be. Um, what, here's my improvement idea. But what is it that others want? And this is what Don and Barbara brought us to at the beginning, asking questions, listening for understanding, being willing ourselves to be changed by the answer. Of course, that means holding that space, creating the psychological safety for ourselves and for others that Don and Barbara talked about. I can remember first meeting Don Berwick in what, 2009, 2010, Don, and I remember being at like kind of a dinner with sort of fancy, what I considered fancy people, and I didn't know how I was there. 
and, um, and you were there. And at one point, you turned in the conversation and you asked me what I thought in front of everybody else. And I was floored. I couldn't believe that you wanted to know. And it expressed, <laughs> expressed to me the, the things Barbara was talking about, humility, curiosity, empathy, inclusion, seeing other people, wondering what they're thinking, listening for understanding. And it signaled to me, wow, that kind of leadership where you're looking for new solutions and new ideas, but you know you don't have all the answers. And if we're going to get there together, that means finding out. Um, so really shifting to a um, position of curiosity. So next slide. Um, I'm just going to zip through this, but the idea here is that um, power in that model of creating distributed power with others, of including others, it means that you're creating it through your relationships. It means that you understand that you're inextricably tied to others if your um, staff wellness is going to really take off, if your improvement work is really going to take off. And that means that we have to pay exquisite attention to those relationships, as Don and Barbara um, have communicated, and we're going to get into how in the communication guide. Um, the next slide really is just a, um, an overview of what happens when we're co-producing to create that power. And that power comes from our mutual commitment, our mutual commitment to each other to, to contribute our unique assets to offering and creating well-being. So if you see yourself on the left and you see someone else on the right, it could be a middle manager, maybe it's a frontline staff, or maybe it's a senior leader, and you want to create uh, something that you could do together to support your staff around well-being, then that's the change you want and you're identifying the other person who may have something they can contribute to that. Step one, step two. Step three, that's where those open, honest questions kick in. What, what does that person want? What do they care about? And also that very first step that Jeff brought us to, which was what matters to you, right? That's the values question. Um, why do you care about this? Where does that come from? And by discerning and listening to, to the answers to those questions, we get to strategize on our feet around how to connect other people's interests and their values to well-being, to the, what we can contribute together to doing um, in advancing well-being, whether that's well-being huddles, whether that's um, as, you know, having a town hall, as some people are chatting in, whether that's having one-to-one um, meetings with you know, staff and others to um, listen and to inquire. Uh, and so this is how, this is sort of the breakdown of how we build that power through co-production, um, through connection. We'll just go to the next slide, please. And again, as I had mentioned, and Barbara and Don nicely pointed out, that this requires something from us. So there's, there's a starting point before we launch into those meetings, which is to, to anchor and center ourselves around, are we ready to receive someone else? Especially if they're not going to agree with us, right? How can we lean into some curiosity there? How could that be a place to move us from fear to hopefulness? And, and same with allowing ourselves to, um, to, to be better than our idea was in the first place based on what comes towards us um, from the other person. So the next slide, is just, this is just gets to more of a concrete um, contribution of what an open and honest question is. When we ask an open and honest question, this is something that does not, uh, it's not closed in that it's not a yes or no question, and it's not leading. You're not trying to get to the answer you would like. Um, instead, it's really saying, I couldn't possibly know the answer to this question. So here are some examples on the next, on the next slide. How do you feel about this? What's your biggest hope? When you faced something similar in the past, what did you do? What would help you now? What's urging you on? These are the types of questions that open up reflective space uh, for people to connect to the what matters um, to them question around their purpose and meaning. And then our work uh, on this slide is to receive them, to deeply listen. And what we've seen already in the Joy in Work Learning Network um, that IHI has led is that these conversations themselves are an intervention for Joy in Work that these conversations themselves generate trust and authenticity and a willingness to um, signal to others that we care about them. So I think Barbara might say a little bit more about how else we can very in concrete terms have these conversations. And, and Jess, I'm not sure if you want to take some questions first. 
Yeah, thank you so much for that, Kate. And what Kate is giving us right now is a, a helpful kind of mindset for going into these conversations. Um, and and Barbara is going to give us some actual examples of how of what those conversations are. Before I do that, though, Don, um, did you have a question for Kate and Barbara? Yeah, I do, um, Kate and Barbara. So your um, counsel is wise as always. Um, However, there are people who arrive in leadership positions, they're we're all human beings, who may not have the, um, from their backgrounds, the personal skills or the level of insight that you're talking about uh, that puts them on a platform to have, make the inquiries you're talking about. So my question's maybe a bit edgy, but how, how, what have you learned about how leaders who are a little underdeveloped, let's say, in their abilities to connect this way, because they have other skills that have made them leaders, but where, where can, how can they, how can they find avenues for change? Maybe it may be as you may mention specific programs or projects or does psychotherapy help? Does it help to join um, some retreat systems or something like that? What, what are some mechanics that leaders who are feeling a little bit sweaty or uncomfortable about this intimacy could, could help, could, could help themselves with? I, I think that's a great point, Don, because um, certainly in my career, I've worked with some brilliant people and I've worked with some people who perhaps should have found another calling um, and, and and some in between. Um, I know the things that have worked for me personally as far as developing skills. Um, so it's finding people you respect and working with them and learning from them. It's um, helping people to see maybe where they have strengths and where they could develop and how you do that in a relationship. Um, so relationship is the basis for um, being able to help a colleague develop skills. Um, and so with not going in and, and saying, boy, you really blew it there, um, but understanding their humanity, um, being filled with compassion as we might with um, those we serve in our communities. So we, uh, if we enter with compassion and empathy rather than judgment, we're more likely to make progress um, and um, to perhaps speak some truth to them. It seemed like you were really uncomfortable in this situation and you're so comfortable in other situations. Colleagues at Kaiser with their innovation work as a way of giving feedback, I really appreciate. They talk about, um, I love or I like and I wish. So I really liked what you were able to do here. And again, that has to be authentic. Um, that's not just making something up to find something positive to say, um, but it's also being honest and saying, and what I wish you could do is be as empathetic as you were in this situation. Um, and then finding resources for people, a safe space for them to talk and learn and grow. Um, I remember interviewing Gary Kaplan for a leadership study that a colleague and I did, and he talks about a, a small network of people he developed a number of years ago and still relies on. So I think who are those people that, that your colleagues can talk to and learn from? So yeah. those are some thoughts. Barbara, your response also kind of speaks to what Mona Cheng was saying in the chat, which is kind of overcoming the sea of negativity. Yeah. Yeah, yeah kind of modeling it yourself and leaning into you know, oh yeah, but I, I and I wish yeah. is sort of a gentler way to do that. And they, we also, sorry, I want to get to you, Kate, but Sharla and Chris have also shared some really great um, responses to Don's question, which is role modeling this concept of vulnerability, which again, Barbara, you were speaking to earlier. I don't know. I mean, that's such a, it's a scary thing to say as a leader, but it demonstrates our authenticity as leaders. Um, and then Chris shares, still learning, but use humor and stories to share my humanity so that it's not too scary for them to hear about my vulnerabilities. Um, I started with the team and the acknowledgement that none of us can possibly be the expert on COVID. Yeah. So we would face it together. Really, really great coaching from and, the chat. And Chris Waleski, I would, I would, any colleague who wanted to learn about leadership, I would refer to her. Um, and uh, I think that her description is, is exactly what Amy Edmondson would say about demonstrating um, that context that develops psychological safety. So there's a script right from it. Great. And Kate, any thoughts before we move along? Yeah, you know, I, could I ask you to go back to slide 13 for just a second? 
because I think, you know, Don, when you ask the question of someone who doesn't practice or is, you know, feeling, frankly, you know, probably a little resistant uh, somewhere inside themselves, you know, some fear is, is probably underneath what's happening there. And that means, you know, we're, it's an invitation to change one's behavior, to learn a new skill. And that's scary. It's like getting on a bicycle for the first time. It's like, you know, you could fall. And you have to be able to have the courage and the choice to get back on the bike. Um, and so, you know, here um, with, with learning, you know, this, this pivot or this mindset or these sets of questions and conversations with folks, it is a practice just like everything else we do. And it can be learned. It can be learned. So it will take inviting those leaders into a safe place where they feel psychologically safe to experiment and where they can identify for themselves with whom they could experiment. Maybe it's their partner. Um, maybe it's a close friend who's also a colleague. Um, and maybe it would help, just like when we learn a new skill like riding a bike, to have a coach, have someone who can support you, who can observe you, who can um, help you. And, and also um, to, to shadow, to find others who are really good at it and get around them, um, see how it's done, uh, take tips from what you're, you're noticing and, um, and, su and support them. You know, I think there, just practically, there are plenty of places to go for this kind of training. Uh, IHI is one of them. Um, you know, Leadership and Organizing for Change is an online course that IHI offers um, that explores many of these practices as well as the psychology of change. Um, I think it's called Activating Agency through IHI's Psychology of Change. And so they're both, I'm sure we can put them in the chat for you at some point. There's also other fantastic centers and organizations probably right around where all of you are, but one is the Center for Courage and Renewal. Um, from which we pull at IHI many of these practices through our partnerships with colleagues there and um, other organizations like the Hendricks Institute, and there are many others. So um, if that's something that folks are interested in, we can try to look up some of those resources and get them out to you. Yes, thank you so much for that, Kate. I'm wondering, Julia, can we, can we ask Chris actually to expand a little bit on um, the comment uh, about opening your her phone line? Um, I don't know if we can unmute folks yeah, on the line. Can we do see. that? Let me see if I can. I think I'll have to promote to a um, panelist, but yes. Chris, one second here. Um, Anne mentioned Don and Chris had these connect connect with Chris calls to reassure the team. Um, and they ended up being kind of a therapy, Don says, for for him. So maybe that would be a place for us to dive in. We're, we're just going off script here. There's so much. <laughs> Uh, really great conversation happening in the chat. I want to lift it up. Chris, you've been promoted to panelists, so maybe you can unmute yourself now. Chris commented she's on her computer. I don't know. Okay. Can sure. you hear me? Yes, you yes, can. Hi, Chris. Okay. Great. I'm outside, so you might also hear birds chirping. Lovely. <laughs> okay, so what would you like me to comment on? Yeah, I, you and Don had conversations or connect with Chris calls. You, yeah, Chris, you put in a very interesting comment that um, the calls, the, the connect with Chris calls are, you said, a sort of therapy or solve for you. And yeah. I thought that was a really interesting comment. What Can you expand on that? What does that, what does that mean and what lessons do you take away from that? Um, I think, you know, when I first started them, I was doing them every day of the work week. And um, they were intended to, I think, um, calm people, but also to keep people connected because a lot of people were off of work. Uh, they were at home and yet they were still part of the team. And I was concerned about them hearing everything that the media was saying and not knowing what was happening in their own Bell and team. And so I started out with that sort of in mind, like, let's stay connected. I don't know how long this is going to last. And I end all of my calls with a Korean phrase, kachi kapshida, which means we go together. And I started out, you know, at the forefront saying, I, I don't know. I don't have all the answers. Um, everything that's coming to you in the media and through the CDC and, and who is also, you know, we're, we're absorbing it um, ourselves. And I really just acknowledged that to them. And... Um, that was a vulnerability in itself because I think sometimes the staff want, they want to know what's the plan, you know, 
um, the uncertainty. They're looking for certainty. And so I started out doing that. And soon I got so many emails and notes and comments from staff saying, thank you so much for doing this every day. I am so stressed out, but that time with you is the time where I just feel myself relax. My dog lays there and listens to you. My cat comes and sits on my lap. My kids want to hear your voice. Um, that there's something that is calming about hearing someone on the phone who I know um, speaking the truth as best we know it that day <laughs> and um, in a calm way, not with hyperbole and exaggeration and politics, but rather just the real uh, local truth of what's happening in our communities and what's happening in our organization. And the feedback and the gratitude and the, um, the fact that I, I didn't even know I was having that effect. And so just knowing that I was having that kind of an effect and having them not lash out at us, but at, for all of the frustration of, I'm not getting my time, my worked hours, my paycheck has been cut. Instead of that, what we got was, I'm at home and I miss my team and thank you for giving me the opportunity to stay connected. Yeah, and so yeah. that, you know, filled me up. So that's amazing. That's amazing. Oh, sorry, I'm getting feedback, but thank you, Chris, so much for sharing that. Um, and this is echoed in the chat. Stephanie saying, "What a gift you've given your team." Um, thank you. Thanks for for taking time to share a little bit more about how you've done that. And for folks who, you know, that that's on a natural way of being, or they don't have that sort of relationship with their staff, um, there are some tools here. And Barbara, um, if you could very quickly, like maybe in five minutes or so, walk us through some of the tools in the um, conversation guide. Yeah. I, I'd be happy to advance your slides. Okay, great, great. Um, and, and starting with this, um, I saw Minty had a, a comment there that I am hearing a fair amount, which is um, what happens when senior leaders are denying the lived experiences of, of team members? Um, she mentioned nurses. It could be any of our colleagues. And it it's, sadly is not just during a pandemic. So I think part of the thing I think about, and, and hopefully the, the conversation guide here might help, is how do you have conversations with your colleagues to build coalitions? Not coalitions against anybody else, but coalitions with, so that you and whatever role you are in and your colleagues can legitimize and acknowledge the situation that, that folks are having, first and foremost. And secondly, perhaps some of those points I made earlier about coaching senior leaders, of sharing a story um, with perhaps you and a couple of colleagues sharing your stories. And here's the ideas we have for, for addressing those. Um, as Chris beautifully illustrated, it's hearing first and then addressing. Um, and I think sometimes there's fear in senior leaders of what am I going to do with this? How are we going to fix this? And that's where it comes back to how are we going to do this together? Not one person. Um, can have all the answers. So let me just highlight a few of the examples that uh, Kate and I put in this conversation guide. Uh, if we think about physical and psychological uh, safety, um, we, kind of, uh, we like the format of do, don't, steps to try, and things that might go forward. So do identify what support looks like for staff and their family. So Chris was open and listening to what people wanted. They wanted some assurance in times of fear. If you think about Kate's curve of, from William Bridges at times of fear, um, don't ignore the personal and family toll on others. So um, you know it's there. You can't fix all of it, but at least acknowledge that. And some steps to try, things like what would support look like for you today? For you today. Um, another one is autonomy and control. That's a huge issue when everything feels out of control. Uh, what can we control? So it's being honest. Again, you heard Chris illustrate that beautifully. And don't assume that everyone knows what it takes to be competent in new roles and doing things differently. Um, and so saying, as we've been saying before, I know this is scary to change roles. I know um, this is hard for people. We have training plans. Um, I always love the phrase from my patient safety work, which is never worry alone. 
It's a phrase I use all the time with people, never worry alone. So you can use this with your colleagues, whether you're a senior leader or you're trying to influence senior leaders. And finally, I'll, I'll just hit on this one, meaning and purpose. Um, so powerful as far as reminding us this is the work we do. And to find meaning and purpose, we also have to take care of ourselves. So we work together to keep each other safe. Um, to remind people that eating and taking breaks are important. Um, to promote also uh, psychological safety is silence is our enemy. If you have questions or ideas, please speak up. So keeping those uh, chains of communication open and again, reinforcing anytime you see a colleague doing some of these well, tell them about it. That's another thing we as senior leaders rarely get. Um, we tend to get feedback when we didn't do things well. And my physician colleagues were always very helpful with that. Um, and they always did it for the most part with good heart. Um, but we often don't get feedback in all of our leadership roles. So give colleagues the benefit of the doubt and say, boy, when you handle that question that way. And so Minty, when I think about people who are going on and on and on about being um, negative, the negative voices I think somebody mentioned is um, hearing, but then saying, let's hear from some other voices, making sure other voices are heard. So Kate, I don't know if you want to contribute to some of these. We wanted to highlight some of the examples. And we have had stories of leaders in conversations actually taking this with them. And when they get stuck, looking at them and saying, well, I've got some notes here. I want to make sure that I'm saying some things that are helpful and using this. Kate? Anything you thanks, have? To thanks, add? Barbara. I would I would just add something I I put into the chat, which is really that a lot of times um, we've seen in the Enjoy Work Learning Network that teams team members have said like, well, I'm afraid to do this because I think this will become a burden on so and so. Right? I'm afraid I'm afraid that this will be too much work for them. And you know, Chris, your example is so beautiful because it, it's a mutual. Uh, you get mutuality out of the engagement with your people. And those relationships are an interest of yours. They're a resource to you. And so suddenly, you know, just have, having some space for this sort of conversation and working at how to have them, it becomes like wellspring for everyone. <laughs> and it moves us from these sort of vicious cycles to these virtuous ones where we prioritize this kind of work because the outcomes of it are healing for all of us. Um, and they they really allow us to, to, to be met as well as meet others. Thanks so much for that, Kate. I um and Barbara, what I want to also lift up about the conversation guide and some of the examples that they just shared is that they were a crosswalk of the IHI framework for joy and work, which you have a link to, but they were also a crosswalk of um, the JAMA Viewpoint article that Kate mentioned earlier in the call, which was by uh, Tate Shanafelt, Understanding and Addressing Sources of Anxiety Among Care Professionals During the COVID-19 Pandemic. Tate is actually going to be our guest speaker on the next call. So we'll, we'll really delve into another way of thinking about listen, support, hear me, uh, some of what they've been sharing here. Um, I also just want to lift up as our final question to all three of our panelists, this theme here, Right now, um, you know, again, Mona, it's such a powerful question about assuring that the sea of negative voices doesn't dominate, that it doesn't dominate the conversation, that it doesn't dominate our meetings or our work, and that it doesn't dominate our minds as part of this uh, self-care and taking care of ourselves, both as, as, as leaders at whatever level we're at um, and individuals in, in our relationships. So I wanna ask each of you, um, how you overcome the neg negativity bias that's naturally kind of hardwired in all of us uh, during the pandemic. And I'll, I'll end with that question to you three. This is borrowed uh, from a colleague. Um, uh, it's about asking people what is working. Um, um, we, uh, we as good healthcare folks are in, in the work because we wanna make things better. Um, that's an inherent thing. So we tend to look for things that aren't going well and then talk about that. Um, and so one of the things is not to deny what is um, not working well, but ask what went well today that we can build on. So what went well? What do you want to take home today? Um, 
to remember that went well. And then maybe ask what one thing should we work on tomorrow? So it's not, a, as someone was saying, denying the lived experience, but also remember, helping people to remember to tap into, you know, some things did go well. Mm. So that's one idea. Thank you, Barbara. Kate? Um, you, I think we're getting good data, of course, when we just listen and let people um, work through what they need to work through. So, you know, sometimes one might feel impatient <laughs> to, to stop the negativity, but um, there's something underneath the hood there that's really worth some curiosity. And I appreciate Barbara's prompt around appreciative inquiry, asking, but pivoting from the negative towards the positive. Um, another question one might ask could be around gratitude uh, and shifting towards what we're grateful for. Um, and we're seeing that as, as a really um, important um, shift from, again, that place of resistance and fear to one of exploration, possibility, and hope. Um, so just thinking about what we're grateful for each day is um, for ourselves and for others. Um, right now, a very important question. I love this. And I, before I get to you, Don, I want to just lift up, folks are adding what they are doing in the chat and I love that. Please continue to chat in. What are you doing to lift up the positive? Don. Uh, great ideas from Barbara uh, and Kate. Uh, two things that may be a little weird. Uh, one is exercise and physical conditioning. I think this is a time when uh, I'm just trying to begin to be physically healthy as I possibly can. And that's made an enormous difference. I just, uh, um, uh, it's personal. Um, the other thing is um, a sense of agency. Uh, this is a political season, and I am up to my eyeballs now in uh, this forthcoming election. No matter what you believe should happen, getting engaged in, moves a sense of disempowerment to a sense of agency, and that's what I'm after. I find when I feel like I'm acting, uh, I feel better, and that's what I'm doing. Thank you so much for that. That's what uh, Marshall Gans calls ICMED. You can make a difference. This idea that we have some self-efficacy even in a time of uncertainty. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you to our panelists for, for this discussion today, for all the wisdom and energy and experience that you brought to this, including all of the leaders that were on the chat. Um, one of the things I'm gonna ask everyone to do is to please share um, your feedback on, on how this went and how we can improve it for next time. Um, we really do take your uh, feedback to heart, especially the ideas for how we can improve future programs. The third and final question in the poll that's popped up on the right-hand side. Um, the next call is going to be September 11th. We're taking a um, little break for Labor Day. Uh, so we won't be on our regular bi-weekly pattern, but we'll have our last call on September 11th um, with, as I mentioned, Tate Shanafelt, and we'll focus again on this sort of um, idea of how do we support health and well-being uh, on our care teams and beyond in the, in the broader workforce. Um, you can learn more. You can access the resources from today. Um, all of the great, uh, the recording will be up on Monday um, uh, on IHI.org slash caregivers. And I just want to say thank you one more time, wishing everyone joy and well-being in your work from the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. I'm Jessica Perlow. Thank you so much.